we've seen death by suicide rates just go through the roof in this community because they oftentimes feel like there's not a lot of help and they can't fathom thinking about 25, 50 more years of this. Myovent Sciences and Pfizer aspire to redefine care for women by developing empowering medicines that can significantly improve lives and change treatment paradigms for conditions that impact women's health. Welcome to the School Nurse Chat Podcast. Today, we'll be talking about endometriosis. We're going to learn about it, and we're going to be aware of what our role is in this issue that affects many. Our guests today are Tara Hilton and Danielle Furlong. Welcome, Tara. Welcome, Danielle. Hey, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Happy to be here as well. Tara, would you share with our audience how you got into this world of being a founder and executive director of a nonprofit dealing with endometriosis? I was born and raised in Wichita, Kansas. And, you know, I spent a lot of my high school years in pain and just feeling isolated and different than everyone. It was normalized. So uh, later on in life, when I finally was diagnosed in 2006, you know, I just decided that I wanted to use my patient journey and everything that happened in between the onset of my symptoms till official diagnosis to help others. And honestly, my mission was just to make sure no one battled alone. The most common feeling I had was just always being alone and not having information or any support. So that's when I decided to officially found a nonprofit. We titled it Yellow Cape. I feel like I wasn't going to let it be a negative. So I put on my yellow cape and I'm there to help others, you know, with everything that I had learned. We uh, started that off in 2017. And then since then, we've just provided support and advocacy and just education to thousands and thousands of individuals battling endometriosis. Danielle, please let us know a bit about you. Uh, My name is Danielle Furlong, and I am from Delaware, the East Coast. My nursing background is from the operating room, working in post-anesthesia care unit and in nursing education before I became a family nurse practitioner. But in addition, I also work as a school nurse in a small charter school in Delaware, and I am a mom of two young children who enjoy keeping me busy, and they love going outside, and we visit the beach frequently. To begin our discussion, for you, Tara, tell us about menstruating students. What is primary dysmenorrhea? One of the things we try to share in our community is that The primary dysmenorrhea is what a lot of adolescents experience, right? So I think something like 90% of everyone that menstruates have the primary. It's basically painful menstruation in the absence of any pelvic pathology. So, you know, if you're having chronic pelvic pain, but you haven't had any pathology to suggest secondary, that's generally, um, you know, how it's defined in the medical community. I don't know if you want me to go into like the personal, you know, symptoms, but that's how we define it uh, here at the Yellow Cape. Thank you, Tara. Danielle, in your work as a family nurse practitioner, can you give us insight now that we've heard what primary dysmenorrhea is? What is secondary dysmenorrhea? So secondary dysmenorrhea is painful period, but unlike not having uh, pelvic pathology, Secondary does include some pelvic pathology, most common endometriosis. Okay, thank you for that. So we we know what we're dealing with. We know that adolescents can have painful periods, but in what ways are those painful periods with no pathology, that primary dysmenorrhea, how is that addressed? Primary dysmenorrhea in the school setting with a parent approval your first line treatment should begin with NSAIDs. Um, This helps block the prostaglandin production. And most of your adolescents and teens will report relief with their NSAIDs. Uh, A small percentage might not respond to the NSAIDs. And as a school nurse, that's when we can have the discussion about following up with like their pediatrician and their GYN, uh, because there may be a discussion there about the option for hormonal medication. Tara, 
What are some of the signs and symptoms that students may experience with primary dysmenorrhea? You know, the most common probably are, you know, pelvic cramps. You get some cramping, some bloating. You know, others may or may not have heavy bleeding, but the cramping, the fatigue, you may experience some hip and lower back pain. Um, But those are usually the most common with the primary. Okay. I appreciate that. So you mentioned, Danielle, some of the treatment. What other forms of treatment other than medication may exist when adolescents are experiencing painful periods? Sometimes it's just getting back to basics. Did we have breakfast? Are we hydrated? Uh, Do we need to just rest for a couple minutes? And sometimes just a warm compress, laying down for a couple minutes for 10 to 15 minutes if their school schedule allows, uh, maybe having that ibuprofen or the acetaminophen, having a nice warm compress, laying down in the nurse's office if there's space available because the nurse's office are usually very busy, but just kind of having a little bit of comfort and giving that time for the NSAID to start working and then seeing if we can go back to class. Uh, Sometimes it's just not all pharmacological treatments, um, just sticking to some basics as well. Okay, that's helpful. And now we've talked about this the painful periods. Let's go into what endometriosis is. We touched on that with the secondary dysmenorrhea, but what is endometriosis and what's the prevalence in adolescent girls? The way that we define it, because there's so much debate in the community on theories of what it is and and how it exists, we try to keep it very benign. And so we define it as endometriosis just being a condition where tissue similar to uh, uterine lining is found outside of the uterine cavity. We don't focus on how it got there or any of the theories, but just basically the tissues found outside of the uterine cavity. As far as the adolescents, you know, that it affects, we know that 90% experience primary dysmenorrhea. And of that 90%, there's somewhere, uh, the studies online show somewhere around 10 to 15% don't respond, you know, to the the NSAIDs and over-the-counter pain medicines. So of those are the ones that are thought to have the secondary and the primary, I think, you know, as Donnell said earlier, the primary cause there is usually endometriosis. No, I really enjoyed Tara's explanation because when you're working with adolescents and teenagers, anxiety is common and sometimes just keeping it very basic, like, this is here. We're not going to worry about how it got there and and worry about it. We're just going to treat what we have acutely right now. And the goal in the nurse's office is to ultimately get them back to class and then also to keep them in school because painful periods is like the number one reason for girls to miss school. So sometimes just trying to keep them back into class, managing the symptoms And like Tara mentioned, there's not an actual number, but yes, most of the adolescents that had failed the treatment of the NSAIDs will be more likely to have the endometriosis. Just a follow-up question to that. When would a school nurse know, Danielle, to refer a student for further treatment? We all build a relationship with our students, and especially if this is a monthly occurrence, we're probably going to have a great relationship with the girls. Uh, We're going to have a good medical history because we probably have seen them once a month or maybe multiple times in one month. So we can kind of gather a history and we can see, is this becoming progressive? Are the NSAIDs not working? We gave the NSAIDs in the morning and they're still having pain. They've tried some other non-pharmacological treatments. That's not helping with the NSAIDs. And you have that good history. So maybe you have a conversation with the parents that this is what we've tried here in school. What have you tried at home? And have you thought about reaching out to either the pediatrician or if the adolescent does have um, a GYN, reaching out to them and just kind of given the history and seek their expert opinion? I do agree with uh, Danielle that, you know, the school nurses are a lot of times that frontline defense for the young girls. When I think back to my own journey, um, you know, I had a nurse that maybe wasn't knowledgeable. And so she had a stigma that everyone has bad periods. So that wasn't helpful, even though I was in there every single month, at least for a day or two, 
laying in with a heating pad and crying and even trying to miss physical education because I couldn't bear to run a mile when I was feeling that way. Nothing ever triggered anyone's radar that something might be wrong. So I think the more awareness and because of that bias that might still be in there with some of the generations ahead of us, I always thought it would be great to have sort of a score-based checklist, right, that would mm-hmm. remove any bias. You ask these certain questions, and if a certain score is reached, maybe the nurse would send something home saying, hey, there's a possibility that there's some symptoms of endometriosis. We suggest you, you know, maybe go to a GYN or a reproductive endocrinologist and, and further check it out. So, yeah, I think, you know, being the frontline defense there and just really triggering that conversation, especially when they see repetitive behaviors, is definitely the best defense that we could have. I really appreciate that perspective. What would it look like, Danielle, from a school nurse perspective to begin some population-based awareness and education in addressing this chronic condition? Yeah, I think before we were to go jump to just endometriosis, like also just giving a baseline about a base education about painful periods and primary and secondary. And sometimes primary uh, can include some tough pain, you know, that we have to work through and just kind of give that support that. Uh, as long as this is kind of our baseline, we can follow up with our pediatrician, but it's okay that you might have some radiating back pain or you might have other symptoms like diarrhea and nausea and vomiting. But then also knowing that when, if it's failing and then the giving the education that this could be secondary and this could be endometriosis. And just talking a little bit about endometriosis and how it's very common in families, like talking about if their mom maybe had endometriosis, how common that it could be for the student to have endometriosis and then have a nice baseline on when is the time to contact further attention if, from your pediatrician. Is the NSAIDs not working or have you had pain from the very beginning of starting? Um, your menstrual cycle, and it's just not improving, it's progressively worse. So I think having um, some education in the school setting, but also keeping it enjoyable too, because, you know, not all the girls want to talk about their period pain, right, in front of other people. So how you can do it privately and comfortably, but also getting the message across that it's okay to have this, we just need to work through the symptoms. Yeah, I hear you with that. We mentioned the family, the generational uh, experiences with periods. And and sometimes in that family, it can be thought that this is normal for us. But just being able to say when treatment doesn't help, when what you do um, to manage the symptoms just doesn't seem to help, that there is a way you can go. There is progression in getting the help that you need. So I appreciate that perspective. Tara, from a community-based setting and with the advocacy that you've done, what types of education and awareness have you done? Some of the things that we focus on, obviously, are awareness campaigns, but we also focus on the support side, right? The medical professionals are the ones working on everything that needs to be done to either get a cure or, you know, some uh, other treatment options. But we just want to make sure no one's alone. So we have we focus on a couple of things. We've created a brochure that's up to date with very basic vocabulary so they can understand without using large medical terms. You know, do you have this very simplistic? Do you feel like you have to urinate a lot? Um, but just keeping simplistic symptoms. We also provide support on talking to their parents about it. Like you said, if it comes from a family history, there may be some unknown bias and stigma. Like I had this, your grandmother had this, this has been for five generations. You're no different. How can you break that cycle, but also have, you know, a valuable conversation that's productive, but also you know, more than anything, I think we've seen the mental health side of this. And I think that's really where we focus our attention on because we've seen death by suicide rates just go through the roof in this community because they oftentimes feel like there's not a lot of help and they can't fathom thinking about 25, 50 more years of this. So really making sure we have support groups and that we buddy people up in our our group and we're constantly checking in and 
you know, we don't cure to claim, treat, or provide any medical guidance, but we say, hey, of the people that have had this symptom, here are some questions you should ask your medical provider. So we just try to steer them in the right direction. And lastly, um, you know, I think a period tracking app is always very valuable and there's a lot of great ones out there, but it really helps you to go in, you know, prepared to your medical provider. So track that, track your symptoms on which days, because it might provide some clarity. And then, you know, lastly, people cringe on this, but social media, it is what it is. It's a great tool out there now and it helps people connect so they can go out there and do a lot of their own research and even see endometriosis specialists talk about it. So that's sort of how we wrap our arms around it from the support group side of it. I want to thank you, Tara and Danielle, for uh, just uh, helping us to walk through what painful periods are and when it is time to really seek more treatment because endometriosis may be the issue. You've uh, enlightened us today, and I think that you've given information that we can move further with. So thank you so much for being our guest today on School Nurse Chat. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. The Uterine Health Guide website is an unbranded, patient-centered information resource that was created in response to needs identified by the Women's Health Patient Advocacy Community. The Uterine Health Guide, UHG, was designed for patients living with uterine health issues to navigate their conditions and learn about menstrual health and period irregularities. The UHG is intended to activate readers to take charge of their health, seek support, and talk to their healthcare providers. This resource is the culmination of efforts by Myovin and Pfizer, guided by the Women's Health Patient Advocacy Community.